Just talk about it. Wow, I should have brought my camera phone. I want a picture of you guys. <laughs> Woo! Incredible energy in here. This is wonderful. This is a full house. You've got a lot of people to come and see you. Yeah. This is amazing. Boy, I hope I don't disappoint. I gotta, <laughs> I gotta pull something out of my hat really quick here. I'm not, <laughs> was it prepared? Well, I think that 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 that's probably going to be my fault because I didn't prepare you well enough. <laughs> so I I, I want to um, start by looking at your background. Um, now your father did a pretty heroic thing um, when you were growing up, if I remember correctly, in integrating the community. Um, you want to talk a little bit about that? Yeah, it was uh, interesting times in North Carolina in the late 60s. Um, there was a time far, far away and <laughs> long ago. It was called 1969. <laughs> and I was a sophomore in high school, my sister, and the community in North Carolina had just been partially racially integrated. Mm -hmm. And so uh, the school had been. And so my sister and I, my father's a minister, we would have a Christmas party every year. And so, of course, since we were interfacing with people of different races, suddenly in the South, some of our friends were African American, so our Christmas party guest list, mind you, it's a sophomore in high school and a senior in high, a junior in high school, my sister and I, included some African Americans. So, yeah, you know, no problem. Mm -hmm. But the deacons at the church that my father was pastoring outside of Wake Forest, North Carolina, had a big problem with it and they wanted him to call off the party. Wow. And he said, I can't tell my children, teach my children that everyone is created equal in the love of God, but some of their friends aren't welcome in our home because of the color of their skin. Wow. So, so we ended up getting a shotgun blast through our house, about 18 bullets through our house during the party at head and chest level through the front picture window. And the next, it was Saturday, Next morning, my dad was fired uh, from the church, and we were told to be out of the community. Wow. This is a real downer. I'm really <laughs> sorry. No, no, no. You know, told to be out <laughs> of the community at sundown. But, you know, now, that was then, and it was a pretty difficult time, and the FBI investigated. The governor offered a reward. Nothing was there. My father went on to have a 30-some-year multicultural, multi-ethnic, multi-denominational ministry. 30 years later, wow. I'm in North Carolina filming Dawson's Creek. And the schools in Wake Forest now have been com totally integrated. And the story of what happened b back in that day became something of a, a bit of an, like an urban legend. Mm -hmm. So I was invited by the president of the class to come to graduation and be the keynote speaker and tell that story and then give a charge to the class about you know, love and inclusion. Hi. It's so good to see you guys here. I'm so glad you're here. Um, I love and inclusion and, 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 uh, and uh, uh, you know, uh, moving through tolerance to appreciation of our differences. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the next day, that was a Saturday, 2,500 people, Raleigh Memorial Auditorium, I gave this speech, not knowing how people would react. It, incredible experience. Next day, my father was invited to the First Baptist Church there in Wake Forest, and it's like the rafters were packed, and he talked about his ministry going forward. At the end, long story short, they call my family down to the front of the church. They offer a public apology, and they give my mom the key to the city. Wow. Exactly. Well, I bring that up because that, that's such a legacy of heroism. And I mean, that's kind of what you've done with The Flash, is that you've been The Flash in one generation, and now you're part of a second generation of that. And that's just a really cool thing. But did that ever have an influence on your acting? Oh, yes. Anything like that. You know, you know they say sometimes, and I think this is across the board for everyone, and I, in fact, this is, I included this in my charge to the class. Sometimes what you think is the worst thing that could possibly happen to you ends up yielding pure gold. You know, some of your, your darkest experiences turn out to be the greatest resource that you have because it connects you with other people mm -hmm. at a very vulnerable level. 
it, it tests your metal, and then it makes you really grateful for the good stuff when it comes. You're just such a hyper positive uh, source of energy. You're just, you're just nice. You're just incredibly <laughs> nice. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> but um, how, did, how did you transition from uh, the 1990s flash to the 21st century? How did that happen? It was amazing. Nothing I ever expected. I always tell people, you know, it was the last scene that we shot at the 19, in 1991 show. It was me and Mark Hamill, like 5 a.m. <laughs> in some place in southeast Los Angeles, and I'm in the flash suit and they yell cut on the final scene, and I rip the wings off and throw them in the air. <laughs> and Mark Hamill almost lost his mind. <laughs> because he's a big comic book collector, so he was like, where are those, oh, don't let them get away, and he was climbing around garbage cans. And then get, he, he got those wings, and he still has them to this day. I can't think of anybody I would rather have have those wings. Yeah, man, I said, I swore at that moment that I would never get in another superhero costume <laughs> ever, ever, ever again. Never say never. But there have been, uh, they kind of did a bait and switch on me, right? Because <laughs> Jeff Johns sort of reimagined the entire Allen family. Mm -hmm. Emmett Walsh, the great Emmett Walsh, played my dad. Priscilla Pointer, who was also Amy Irving's mother. She played my mother. Well, Emmett Walsh was not wrongfully convicted of killing Priscilla Pointer in front of a 10-year-old me. You know, that wasn't our origin story. So when I, when I read that that's how Jeff Johns had reimagined it and people said, are you going to be part of the new project? I said, well, if they come to me, that's the role I would want. Mm -hmm. And then that's, that's the role they offered. And everyone, everyone said, Jay Garrick, Jay Garrick, Jay Garrick. And I was like, I would not have been as enthusiastic 24 years later going back right away into another superhero suit. It was hard enough going through, you know, Henry, uh, you want me to do what? You know, but, uh, but to go in as the father, having played the role, Grant knew I had played the role. I kind of had a hint of what his hopes and dreams going into an iconic role like that are and some of his insecurities. And it just meshed, I think, don't you agree? We've talked about this online, and the, these ladies right, right here who are so supportive of the Flash community, stand up. <laughs> I want to thank you for everything that, that you ladies do um, for us. Um, what was I saying? <laughs> supportive of the community. Uh, oh, yeah. And uh, I still, I've lost it. I've totally lost my train of thought. Coming back as uh, Jake Eric. Oh, coming back as Jake Eric, yes. And Barry. Uh, and uh, Henry, yeah, that it would carve out a special place for Grant and I. Because the way the scenes were written, it was adventure, adventure, excitement, excitement, you know, music, lights, action, wonderful CGI effects, you know. Mm -hmm. And then everything would stop, you'd see Iron Heights, the lights would go down, and we'd walk into that phone booth and pick up those phones, and it was just him and me. And I figured that that would carve out a very special place uh, and a very special way without it being on the nose. You know, here's the baton, kid, go get him. You know, to, to hand off the project and to support the next generation. You know, Mark Hamill had just come from Star Wars when he was doing the Trickster episode, and he and I were riding back to the hotel one night, and he said, what a unique opportunity it is to come back a quarter of a century later and participate, not in a token way, but in a meaningful way in handing off the project to the next generation. So, you know, people ask me about those scenes, and I say, you know, we just memorized the lines, and we showed up and looked at each other, and there was so much of our background that was done for us, you know, a couple of Norfolk, Virginia boys were both from the same town. He went to the same high school as my mother. Oh, jeez. <laughs> he was born, we're born in the same month, eight days apart, and he was born the year I was doing The Flash. So he used that to psych himself up during the audition process. So a lot of our background was done for us. So that part was easy. I tell people I would have wanted to play Henry Allen even if I had never played Barry. Having played Barry, helped me to play Henry better. 
because I had the history and I had the background. And I just, you know, and it helped an awful lot because I'm so fond of him. People ask me, what is Grant Gustin like, right, mm -hmm. right? And I say, <laughs> I, 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 these ladies know uh, what he's like. He's, what you see is what you get and the humanity that, that is so important for the character of Barry Allen, specifically among superheroes. You know, that, human, that guy who wants to do the right thing, you know. Um, I always say his heart's in the right place and his head is just trying to catch up, you know. <laughs> but Grant has that in spades. So, uh, yeah, it was uh, now when they said, okay, I figured after, at the end of second season after Henry got out of prison, you know, I didn't want to be sitting around as Henry Allen in my underwear eating pizza and saying, what, are you going to the crime lab today, Bear? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nobody wanted to see that. <laughs> so I figured Henry's usefulness as a plot device and as a character would be tapering down and we would lose him in some way. Okay. So I get up there for the last four episodes of that season, and I'm having a costume fitting. And, and the costume designer, after we, I'm trying on this shredded suit, this brown, I'm like, well, this kind of looks like my prison suit, but it's all shredded. I don't know, are we having a flashback? Or, I try it on, I don't ask you. And, uh, and Kate Maine, who's so wonderful, she said, in an aside, of course you'll be fitted for the iron mask separately. <laughs> and I'm like, the iron what? She's like, oh my God, you didn't hear it from me. <laughs> okay, so now I'm on the set with uh, Jesse Martin and Grant, and we're in between takes, and we're sitting uh, just off set. And they said, so did you hear what you're going to be doing? I said, yeah, I'm the man in the iron mask. Go figure. <laughs> and they're like, yeah. <laughs> Is that all you know? <laughs> and I was like, there's more? <laughs> and he said, you're the real Jay Garrick. I said, stop it. You, I mean, that's just no way that is possible. But they, I, 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 and then I got in touch with Greg, who I've known for 20, over 20 years. He was a, uh, a writer uh, on Dawson's Creek. And, um, and he told me, and he spun out the story, that in the course of two episodes, I'd be killed as one character, I'd be revealed as a character that everyone has been wondering who he was, who would turn out to be the real Jay Garrick, which is the character y'all wanted me to play to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I said to Greg, I said, you know, even take me out of the equation, that's just masterful storytelling. And that's what happens when you have producers and writers who are not creating product for mass consumption. They are, they were fans of the first Flash, that's why we see so much of it coming forward. They love this medium, they respect this pop cultural art form, and they are writing and producing a show that they want to see. If everybody else enjoys it, that's fine with them too, mm -hmm. you know. But uh, I think it's their love of these characters and their genuine affection for this story and this universe. And the fact is that, you know, I mean, they could be sitting in this audience, you know, and eating it up, you know? I mean, it's not, there's something about the quality of that that I think, particularly at the beginning, the heart was so evident in the, that first season of Flash that I think it communicated, okay, I'll sit down. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking about those elements, um, what? elements from the comic version of The Flash do you try to incorporate into your roles? Um, well, I think the important thing that I learned about Barry Allen early on, I've hinted at it. His heart is in the right place. His head's trying to catch up. You know, I think of all the superheroes, uh, Barry Allen is a uniquely good guy. He is the everyman, mm -hmm. you know. He's not rich, you know, um, edgy Batman. He's not right on the edge of vigilanteism, Arrow, he's the guy that really wants to do the right thing. Um, in my version of The Flash, I was in a family where my father was a street cop, my brother was a street cop, real cops worked the street, my father was constantly discounting me, not in real life, this is my <laughs> screen father, Barry Allen's father, Emmett Walsh, 
I tell people, uh, believe me, I give Grant or gave Grant as Henry Allen a lot easier time than Emmett Walsh gave me. <laughs> <laughs> ah, what are you doing? What are you looking at? <laughs> Love Emmett. But, uh, but, you know, and, but Barry was the one who said, okay, I'll go be in the crime lab so that mom doesn't have to worry that all the men in her family might not come home at night. Mm -hmm. You know, and hats off to the men in our community who, who, who serve, you know. So anyway, so Barry Allen is the, is the guy who's used to dad saying, uh, what's he going to do, stub his toe in a footprint, ha, 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 you know. And, uh, and then he gets these powers. And I love what happens to him. He doesn't want them. He doesn't want, it's not Hugh Hollywood hero, you know, in our version. It's I want to get rid of him. And he goes to Amanda Pays, <laughs> Tina McGee, and, uh, and says, I want to get rid of this. I don't know what this is. I don't want to know from it. And then his brother is killed by a street gang. And then it's on. And then he says, I want a cow to cover my face so nobody will know who I am. And I want a symbol like that red splotch that they put up on buildings. And I want to strike terror to their heart. And I want to avenge the death of my brother. And I was like, wow, OK, these are themes of classic drama, you know, that nobody but you knew was there all along. Mm -hmm. And I always say to, uh, to convention audiences, aren't you proud of yourselves? Mm -hmm. Because the rest of the entertainment community has finally caught up with you. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's like uh, comic books mainstream. And um, I don't know where I am in answering your question. <laughs> I've probably answered about 12 questions. <laughs> this is fine. You just, this is your show. <laughs> But, but yeah, but, that, but the part of your question being, what parts of Barry, Barry Allen do I try to, did I try to bring out him and play? And it was that. I, 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 when I was about to play Jay, I went back and watched my, my, a couple of my episodes mm -hmm. as Barry. Because I wanted to remind myself, I knew I had to set a different template for Jay than I had for Henry. If I came out of the Iron Mask and it was Henry, where's the fun of that? Mm -hmm. That's why when I first came out of the Iron Mask, and everybody's looking at me like I had two heads, and I have scruff, and you know, the original line was, is something wrong? And we talked about that, and I thought, how about instead of is something wrong, what if it's like, what? <laughs> you know, and then we go to that great scene um, with Dawson's Creek playing on the counter in the diner, which was very weird. I. I <laughs> I'm like, okay, too many overlapping Earths. <laughs> and, uh, but the fact that I said, he said, well, how much do you know? I said, well, I know that I, I, you know, I look like, uh, like your dead dad. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the deal. What kind of superhero are you going to be? Yeah, I get that you've had a tragic life. You know, I get that your parents were killed. But now you're messing with the speed force, which is my territory, and it's big boy rules. And so that was my template for Jay going forward. And I like to tell people that I, I took elements of my Barry, who was a little bit edgier than Grant's, but my Barry was old. I was 10 years older than Grant when I came to the role. And uh, I brought elements of that guy forward and, uh, and made him my Jay, incorporated him into my Jay. So working dynamics on the show, I mean, you've already mentioned your great relationship with Grant. Um, who do you enjoy working with? Like, who really makes you laugh on the show? Well, the whole group. I mean, particularly that first season. And particularly dropping in and out the way I did. Mm -hmm. Of course, I did the first two or three episodes in a row. Everybody was getting to know each other. Then I go away for several episodes. And then I come back, and it's like, okay, there's Jesse Martin and Grant learning new tap dancing steps <laughs> in that corner. And then here comes Tom giving Carlos a ride in his wheelchairs, and they're <laughs> popping wheelies in the wheelchairs. And then somebody else bursts into song, and I'm like, what, what, what have I just stumbled into? It, it was like life in the asylum, you know? <laughs> Which is that wonderful spot, combustible energy that that cast has. You know, when we went to San Diego Comic Con for the first time, you know, people say, how does the cast get along? And it was a huge room, a big catered meal. 
all the shows were there. We debuted our pilot in front of 7,000 people in Hall H at San Diego Comic-Con. And uh, it was time to eat. And so all the actors from all the different shows went with their people, their publicists, their agents to separate tables and uh, to eat, you know, to get away from each, uh, you know. And somebody punched me and they said, look around this room. And you saw everybody with their people, and there was one table in the center of the room, and that's where the flash cast was. And the flash cast was all together, and, uh, and it was that way sort of from the beginning. So, you know, I don't know, as far as singling out, I've been able to, uh, in Enter Flash time, I really felt like Jay Garrick was a part of the team, really for the first time. I loved being in a scene with Killer Frost. I loved the things, spontaneous things that happen when Jay says, okay, I'm gonna train the new speedster and, and there will be a new speedster when I'm done training her. And then I, you know, I tell everybody, bye, always a pleasure, Flash. I go and on the way out, just spontaneously, you know, Carlos just, you know, we give each other one of these and they got it on camera. I, you know, little things like that happen when you have a cast that's genuinely fond of each other, you know. Mm -hmm. Who's your favorite Flash villain? Oh, come on. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what other villain has suspended me 35 feet in the air by my ankles, handcuffed with my hands in front of me, dip me down into a big plexiglass case full of gallons in, of water, and then blew up the tank. The trickster. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's like, first of all, I just love Mark. Mark and his family are so affirming and so supportive, and, and uh, you know, I always love seeing uh, Mary Lou and Chelsea, and it's, it's what a great family they are, and enthusiastic, you know, and, and I, 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 I've, I've learned from him. Because in 1990, going into a costume superhero drama isn't what it is today, as you guys know. You know, we were used to these stories being spoofed. I was a little nervous about it. I was a little anxious about, about going into a superhero suit. And then they said, don't worry, we're not gonna put you in red tights. <laughs> I came to regret that. <laughs> Because they spent $100,000 in 1990 to build four suits, you know, that were this incredible construction, but were very difficult. But I was a little self-conscious. Well, here comes Mark <laughs> as the trickster, working that spandex. <laughs> you know, and he was owning it, you know. And uh, I learned a lot from him uh, in that first season to kind of get over myself and, uh, mm -hmm. and enjoy. That's also a, something I enjoy about Grant's portrayal. I never wanted to say dialogue in the suit. I wanted to be monosyllabic. I only wanted pieces of it shown to keep it very dark and so that it didn't get what I was afraid might be silly. Well, Grant wears that suit now 24 years later like a second skin. You know, he's jumping on tables, he's, you know, running around, you know, you guys have seen him. He's, uh, he'll say dialogue, he does character development in the suit, he's so comfortable in it. I used to never do the running pose when asked. I would always go, no, 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 no I don't really want to do that. But, you know, seeing the freedom with which Grant assumed the role has freed me up, mm -hmm. you know, to, to do a lot more things at conventions and Go, go a little bit further than I otherwise would have. I think your mic is on. Yeah, I think it did. Hello? Yeah. Hello, hello? Did I, oh. Ah, right. that's why. Hi, am I back? We're back. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a good point in time. I'd like to uh, turn the time over to your fans for questions. And yes. folks, if uh, we can keep them really sharp so uh, people can have as much opportunity. Um, I'll have to put my glasses on, unfortunately. I actually have to see you. So uh, let's go right in the middle, right there. Let's go. Uh, sure, there you go. <laughs> it's good. I'm good. Are you enjoying the rest of the con since I saw you? Yes, I am. Good. Um, I love Ezra Miller as a performer. I enjoy all of his work. I'm, uh, uh, I'm looking forward to seeing the Flash movie because I think we've only scratched the surface of his Barry Allen. 
you know? And I look forward to seeing the heroic parts and the depth that I believe is in the character of Barry Allen. I, I, I look forward to seeing him grow into those parts of the character. They, they, they kind of, I might get in trouble for saying this, but they kind of used him as comic relief in the Justice League movie, right? You know, so I'm looking forward to seeing the, yeah, and that's wonderful, we love the comedy. There is a lot of comedy and, you know, like, as I said, tripping over his own footprint before he analyzes it, you know, in Barry Allen. I'm looking forward to the heroic uh, parts and, and, and him fleshing, uh, fleshing that character out. Let's go right beside him. Thank you. Thank you. What was it like? What? You know, they said the most perceptive things. Like, Candace said to a friend of mine, uh, and this is how you know they really study it and they're serious. He said, she said, you know, one thing John didn't have that was such an interesting plot device and important plot. John didn't have an iris because our iris didn't go through the season, you know, it, it ended after, after the pilot. Their idea being that Barry could date Megan, he could date Tina, he could date whoever. But, but, but that, that she said, I thought that was something that was a real challenge for him, that he didn't have an iris, you know. I mean, they were all um, so warm and welcoming and excited, you know, and exciting. I'll, I'll tell you a story about that first prison scene that Barry and I do, um, that Grant and I did in the pilot. Um, we, it was beautifully written, very emotional. And then on top of that, we got to my close-ups and David Nutter, Emmy Award-winning director, Game of Thrones, who did our pilot and set the template for our show. He came up to me right before it's time to shoot my, my shots and he said, okay, we've written some dialogue that we didn't want you to hear or see until this moment. So don't come in on your cue until you hear Barry say, I love you. Just listen. And I'm thinking, oh my God, what is this? And so all those words were when he looked at me and there's Grant talking to John and there's Barry talking to Henry, and he says, you remember the time when people told me to change my name because I shouldn't want to be associated with you? Well, I am glad I didn't change your, my name. I am proud of you. I can hardly say it. <laughs> <laughs> and I am proud to be your son. You know, and right, for, well, I just lost it. No, I just lost it, and then Grant lost it. And then I lost it some more. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it led to that beautiful moment with our hands up against the glass. Um, the whole experience, somebody asked me, I don't know if you're in your room, raise a hand, if it had been a sort of sense of completion for me coming back to the new Flash. And I thought that was a really interesting question. And it has, because I did sort of feel at the end of our season, there was unfinished business. And I got to come back in kind of a wonderful and unexpected way. I tell people it took us 24 years to get a second season. <laughs> <laughs> uh, to, to have some completion around that. Well, it's St. Patrick's Day. I think we have to go with the guy in the green over here. Ah. <laughs> when you were originally cast as the Flash back in the 90s, how long a process was it for you? Was it that they wanted you right away? Or did you have to do the audition? Um, I began hearing about it in the fall of 89. And I was like, I'm not sure I want to go from New York and having been on Broadway and, and had a couple Emmys and I wasn't so sure I wanted to go into a costume superhero week after week. And I talked to April Webster, multiple Emmy Award winning casting director for Lost and a bunch of things, and she said, John, just read the script. And that's when I read and I found out all the dimension that is in the character of Barry Allen. And uh, 
And then I said, okay, yeah, I want to audition for this. I think they read something like 50 or 60 guys. And they narrowed it down to two of us, Richard Berge and myself. And uh, this is after multiple readings, meetings at Warner Brothers and CBS. And they took us for the test at CBS. And, uh, and then they, I, I guess it was a couple month, uh, and then when they decided they wanted me, then the negotiations began. And that shortened my life by, you know, <laughs> eight to ten months. You know, my manager would say, okay, well, they called and they made the offer. I said, oh, they did? Oh, that's great. I, would you, he said, I thanked them very much and hung up. <laughs> I'm like, you did what? <laughs> he said, yeah, they called back and they raised the offer. I said, well, thank, thank you very much. And I'm like, Hank, you can't, you know. He, but he was very smart about about you know how far how far you could push but uh yeah you know i heard and i swear i hope it's not true but i heard that after the test the president of cbs <laughs> the president of cbs said that guy's head would look good on a lunch box <laughs> <laughs> i hope that's not why i got the part i think we have one over here Hi. You were wonderful uh, in Everything Ever Every Story. Oh, thank you. I was wondering how was it working with John and Jonathan? It was great. And you know, Jonathan came and did an episode of The Flash, 1990, the episode Child's Play. Jonathan was a really special kid. I, I got to tell you, it, it broke my heart you know, when I heard what had, uh, what had happened to Jonathan. And I learned on set right before I went to film a scene. I can't remember what project it was. And I was like, okay, whoa, well, I, I have to take a five, ten minute break. It was great. He was totally there. He was totally alive in the moment. You know, I was a bit of a jerk father at the beginning of Never Ending Story too. I've, I've played my share of superheroes and psychopaths, you know. <laughs> and... Uh, the Teen Wolf Dad. I always know when someone's coming up to my table like this, <laughs> that I'm like Mr. Leahy, Teen Wolf, right? Well, I'm, <laughs> and then I'm like, I'm really sorry. You know, I'm really <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, yeah, he was great to work with. He was, he was a great kid. That was a really good experience. Yeah. I think we had one right here. <laughs> Well, it was really challenging in the 90s. At what point Danny Bilson was going to get me a psychotherapist to help deal with this? And I said, it's not a mental problem. I said, it's like, it's hot, you know. But it was, uh, it was really interestingly made. I mean, they, you know, the way they made the suit was they, they, well, first they greased me down, and then they wrapped me in cellophane, and then they put, I was like, why are they doing all this? And then, <laughs> then they put a spandex suit on, and then they began to glue, after they'd done a body cast to my muscle structure, individual foam latex sculpted pieces onto this suit. And the reason that they had wrapped me, greased me down and wrapped me in cellophane was the glue gets very hot while it's setting. And so I soon found that out. And, uh, and then they built this kind of amazing construction, put an electromagnetic charge through the suit for the flocking so it made, gave it that furry look. And then the problem was I'd be in it 20 minutes and I'd start sweating through the muscles. And I thought it looked really cool, but they said, no, that's not, that's not in the, <laughs> nothing about that in the comic book. So they had a solution. They sprayed it with a sealant so it would all stay inside. So I was the sponge. You'd come up and go, you know, and the water would just drip off him. They'd take my gloves off and just dump the sweat off. They came up with a, a suit, a uh, vest like race car drivers wear to circulate ice water through the suit in between scenes. Because I'd have it on and the cowl in my day was glued to my face and my chin. And so it, once I was in, it wasn't coming off. You know, the director would be giving me direction and I'd be like, you know, listing. <laughs> So they'd pull the hose out, plug me into the ice chest, and I'd wake up. And the, <laughs> the other issue with it, it was it was all one piece. They couldn't clean them. No. Uh. Yeah, my sentiments exactly. <laughs> so that what they would do is they would take the suit at the end of a day, soaking, dripping wet, spray it with Lysol, and hang it in my trailer. So that, 
five in the morning, it would still be wet and sticky when I, when I put it on. So I broke out all over my back. And, you know. Having said this, nobody wants to hear an actor who's been privileged to be cast in one of these, to play these iconic characters, whine about how difficult it, oh, my suit was so hard, you know. But there are challenges, you know, involved. Now, today, we have an undersuit, uh, under armor with a heightened muscular structure, and uh, an outer leather shell. And uh, no need for an ice vest or hose, hosing, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and Grant, thank God, they no longer have to glue his cowl to his face, you know, so he can, it's, you know, he can get that thing off. And, but, but I'm in the Jay Garrick suit going, man, this is Christmas. <laughs> they said, do you need any water? I'm like, no, no, I'm fine. I think there was a young gentleman over there. In the original Flash, it has to be one of my favorites that I immediately think of. Uh, it has to be the very last scene with Sean. You know, I get choked up thinking about that moment right now because I was so fond of Tim Thomerson as my brother Jay and when he got killed. And we go through that whole thing avenging his death and we're sitting on the porch and I, and I, and I have Jay's medal, track medal. And I'm, and I'm talking to his son about Jay. And I say, you know, Jay, Jay didn't lose, he just ran out of track. And, and then I tell him, I say, I may not be as fast as your dad, but if you ever need me, I'll be there. I'll be there in a flash. Oh, that's cool. You know, that was such a, a, a heart, heartfelt moment. I have, to say, I have to say, that's the one that came to mind. Yeah. That's cool. Uh, right here in front. Hi, John. Hi. You know, Helen and I had almost the same line. Remember when the trickster, I was under a box of knives, I already kind of knew that Barry was, Grant was, that uh, Barry was Flash, and I'd gone through the hospital scene where he was on the front page of the paper, and I'm like, you know, yeah, he saved Joe. I guess Joe was lucky. Yeah, well, I got saved too right in the nick of time. And he goes, oh, don't you think I would tell you if I was the Flash? And I go, yeah, but... I'll tell you one thing, if the Flash were my son, I'd tell him a few things. I'd tell him it's dangerous, you know, and so to be careful. I'd tell him he's a hero and he's saving a lot of lives, but most of all, I'd want him to know that his father's proud of him, you know? What was your question? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes. And then in the next epi episode that we did, the trickster episode, Henry's sitting under a box of knives, and Flash comes in and saves him, and finally decides to show his dad. And in that moment, Grant Gustin, I swear, he turned into a 12-year-old boy. He <laughs> pulls his cow back and kind of looks at me like this, and I, my line was, well, you always did look good in red. <laughs> Helen Slater, I'm watching Supergirl, and she says, well, you always did look good in blue. <laughs> and I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. But yeah, it's great. Again, uh, you know, it's not a calculated thing. It's because they love the show and they love this universe and they love this world that they bring all these parts that they loved when they were young into the current iteration. I think there was a guy in a Flash t-shirt over there. Hi. Wouldn't that be fun? I'll tell you what else would be fun. Now that we have Corin Bora prank, we have Devin as the trickster wannabe, and we have Mark Hamill's trickster, and they're all a family. I want them to come to Earth 3 and battle Jay Garrick, and I want the episode to be called Trickster Family Values. <laughs> I think we have a lady in, is that a rogue costume?
Yeah, yeah, yeah. I enjoyed that episode so much. I don't know. You know, I sort of come in, I sort of drop in as needed, you know? It's like, you know, it's fine with me. You know, let Grant do the heavy lifting now, <laughs> you know? But, um, you know, people say, you retired, you retired. And I remind people that in the comics, Jay Garrick was already retired the first time he met Barry Allen. And he came out of retirement to fight the thinker. He came out of retirement to fight. Uh, uh, he was always coming, going in and out of retirement, you know, as needed. For me, as important as, if ever there is a superhero that legacy is important to, it's the Flash. Golden age, silver age, modern age, you know? And so I, would, I love the prospect of training new speedsters. And I hope that next season, we get into that legacy. Because I would love to transition, uh, even though the suit is so much more comfortable, <laughs> I would love to transition into that role. You know, I love it in the comics, those Sunday dinners when Joan and Jay are having the speedsters over with their French bulldog, you know, you know. I just happen to have a French bulldog. <laughs> um, no, but, uh, you know, it, I'd love to, uh, to, to do more of that stuff to be the coach, mentor, you know, kind of, kind of deal. I think we've got time for a couple more questions. Um, let's go with the guy with the baseball cap over here. I have to make a confession. Inevitably, I'm asked this question, and it embarrasses me, because uh, unless I just start making stuff up, I have to tell you that I didn't know who the Flash, I mean, they said to me, Flash, and I said, you mean Flash Gordon? <laughs> and of course, now when people ask me that, I go, no, the Flash, you know, I'm highly insulted. But no, I didn't. I didn't know anything. It was a process of discovery for me through Danny Bilson and a moment to remember Paul DeMeo, you know, who recently passed away, our executive uh, producer, co-executive producer of the original Flash. Um, I took everything I needed from their script, but then I got curious. I had to actually learn more about Jay Garrick, go back in and learn about, okay, what's Jay Garrick's position? I did more studying for Jay than I did for Barry. I just took everything from Bilson and DeMeo's wonderful script because I knew I wanted to reset the template for Jay, but I also had to honor what you guys have, have enjoyed about the Jay Garrick, Barry Allen relationship. I couldn't break that thread, but I wanted to start from a little distance, like, okay, you know, this is my speed force, don't screw it up, you know? And then gradually, through taking Wally's place in the speed force, through enter flash time, start to have uh, a closeness, uh, but in a different way. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> I think we have to go with the guy in the Star Trek costume. <laughs> Yeah. Um, even with what you just admitted, it is so refreshing to hear somebody who's on board with the fandom and with the, with the reality. Uh, I, we've seen a lot of performers who are coaching and, and enjoying the fame, but not necessarily in love to the extent that I hear from you. Uh, but my question is, if there was another superhero that you got to play that wasn't the Flash, who might that be? God, I don't know. You know, I mean, if we just take The Flash, I've played Barry Allen, I voice Professor Zoom in Batman the Brave and the Bold, I was Henry Allen, and now I'm Jay Garrick, so who's next, Nora? I mean, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. You know, I, don't, I really don't know who that would be. It's just been such a rich, there isn't another. I would want to stay, you know, I, I dig this universe. And let me say one thing, actors who take the attitude that you described at the beginning are missing out on so much. Because let me tell you one thing that I know. The Flash was 50 years old when I got to it in 1990. 75 years old when Grant Gustin got to it in 2014. It was going on before we got here and it will be going on when me and Grant and Ezra are long gone. You guys are the keeper of this flame and I just wanna Thank you for allowing me to take this journey with you for this moment in time. Wow. And that's, that's a great note to end on. John, thank you for spending your time with us. And everybody, let's give it up. John Wesley Shipp. Thank you for watching.
watching the Convention Junkies coverage of the 2018 Toronto Comic Con. Please like, comment and subscribe to see more. If you would like to help us with future projects, please visit our Patreon page.